Uh, Dr. Stephen Clasco is going to be our first speaker, and his presentation is titled, Is There an Avatar in the House? Changing the DNA of Healthcare in the Age of AI. Stephen uh, is a transformative leader, an advocate for the revolution of our system of healthcare and higher education. As president and CEO of Philadelphia-based Thomas Jefferson University and Jefferson Healthcare since 2013, Stephen has steered one of the nation's fastest growing academic health institutions based on his vision of reimagining healthcare and higher education. Stephen has combined the first design thinking curriculum in medicine with the nation's leading research on empathy and has some controversial things to say about the future of healthcare and medical education. So with that, Stephen, I invite you to the podium and look forward to your presentation. Thanks. Well, thank you. And um, just uh, 30 seconds uh, on how I got to where I am. I actually started out as a DJ. Um, <laughs> and actually, that was back when um, DJs made less than doctors. I probably should have stayed in that. But um, uh, ended up in uh, private practice. Um, OBGYN, and I'd still be in private practice in Allentown, Pennsylvania, uh, if it wasn't for, and I have to think back to 1982, 97% of OBGYNs were male. The number one performed procedure in this country? Both countries, actually, Canada and the United States. Uh, C-section was number two, hysterectomy was number one back then. So uh, males, and I happened to walk into a uh, Penn State University lecture from a professor, as I remember him, a very old professor, as I think of it, it was probably my age now, I was 30 at the time, and he was talking about hysterectomy, and he was telling his students, you know, if you see a little fibroid, just take out the uterus, because, you know, after a woman's reached her childbearing age, you know, she doesn't need that. And all the students were writing that down. I happened to be at Barnes & Noble that night, and four of the top 10 nonfiction bestsellers were what my hysterectomy did to me, the hysterectomy hoax, how a hysterectomy ruined my life. So it was an aha moment for me about that what we're teaching these students is not what's really happening out there. I left my private practice. I went into academic medicine, did some of the early work on psychological and sexual effects of hysterectomy, and then worked with some folks in Houston around some of the things we now use to avoid hysterectomy. Fast forward to the 90s, I built up my academic career, and a similar aha moment happened because I watched all these really brilliant doctors complain about the business of medicine. And I remember listening to one neurosurgeon who had revolutionized the procedure to do minimally invasive brain surgery, talking about it just doesn't understand insurance companies and business. So I went to uh, Wharton School at University of Pennsylvania, got my MBA, and after that, got a million dollar grant to look at what makes physicians different than, depending on the audience, either other people or normal people and how we handle change. <laughs> Um, and that was sort of a curious area of research until all this change happened, and then it became sort of somewhat important. So, so I had an opportunity uh, to take over a 195-year-old academic medical center in 2013 that had really been uh, really one of the leaders. We were actually started as the first medical school in the country, in the United States, that was based on seeing humans. We were the fifth medical school in the United States. So we were started in 19, 1824. Before us, the other four, you would do all your research in academics, and then you would get your MD and practice on humans. That's where the term I'm gonna start my practice came from. At Jefferson, we were started by a guy named Dr. McClellan who said, gosh, I think seeing humans might be a little bit important in being a doctor, and that was sort of our legacy. That led to the 50 or 60 year old now Jefferson scale of empathy. So uh, without spending a lot of time talking about Jefferson, one of the things about Philadelphia is you get kicked out of the city if you don't mention the Eagles winning the Super Bowl at least <laughs> once. And also, um, we actually had a Super Bowl commercial with Jefferson, so the other nice thing from a Wharton point of view, it cost me a half a million dollars. The more I'd play it, then the board, uh, so this is 30 seconds on Jefferson.
Okay, so that, that's, that's Jefferson. Now, thank you. Now, most of this is going to be on the future, but I want to go back into the past for a minute, because the first time I ever got a chance to come to your amazing city was in 1978. I was a senior medical student, and I was uh, a, a senior member of the American Medical Student Association, and we had a joint thing with the Canadian Medical Student Association. And um, I remember it very well, because they wanted medical students to, to talk about what they were concerned about in the future of, 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 of medicine back in 1978. And I remember, because it was the first time I'd seen my favorite group, which was the Rolling Stones. This is what they sounded like back then. You can't always get what you want. And, and I remember. You can't always get what you want. And I remember being, uh, I remember saying, gosh, um, it seems like we need to get physicians to embrace change and be optimistic about the future. Boy, can we do anything to reduce um, health inequities? And uh, my bank just got an ATM. Why can't healthcare do cool things like that? And I remember being very nervous about the, uh, uh, about the talk and, and the, the weekend before seeing a movie uh, that nobody thought would make it about uh, a rebel alliance taking over the world. So, so here we are in 2018. Um, and you know, uh, the Rolling Stones are still around. So, um, so Mick still can't get what he wants. Uh, and, and in 2018, I would say, gosh, can we get physicians to embrace change and be more optimistic about the future? Can we do anything to reduce health inequities? And uh, how come I can do all my holiday shopping uh, while I'm watching Game of Thrones in my pajamas, but if I have a stomach ache, I still have to get on the phone, listen to 11 options to get an appointment next Wednesday? And just I was thinking, wow, it's 40 years, not much has changed. On my IMDb, the number one grossing film this year was this. <laughs> so, so really, nothing has changed in 40 years. Now, one thing has clearly changed in 40 years. Um, this was me in 1978. <laughs> and um, one of the things about getting old is I don't miss the hair, but I really miss the car. That was a 1968 Pontiac GTO 400 four-barrel Ram Air. Gladly give up the car. And the leisure suit will probably also uh, not make it back. So I think we can all agree, though, um, that that's going to change, that, that we are, as, as uh, Gail said, at, at a revolution. So um, I'd, like to, I'd like to get you in the mindset, since this is all about AI and technology and humans, I'd like to get you, if you don't mind, in the mindset of November 2028. So you know, I would like you to think about where we're in November of 2028 and what's going on. Well, first of all, our new president, Kim Kardashian, um, <laughs> is taking her uh, daily selfie, so we haven't gotten much better there. Um, you'll be happy to know that there's one new Indiana Jones movie, The Legend of Bingo Night. Um, so that's, uh, that franchise is still going. Oh, and the Rolling Stones, Rolling Stones are still doing very well on the uh, Walking Dead tour. But um, more importantly, healthcare has finally broken the cost, access, quality, and patient experience curve through a series of disruptive events and creative partnerships. And I'd like to talk a little bit about how we got there and what happened in 2018, 2019, 2020 to get, get us there. I'm on IBM Watson Health's uh, advisory board, and um, I think one of the breakthroughs that's going to happen much quicker than, than you might expect is how many of you have an Alexa or, or Google Home or a HomePod, right? So, so you know, you get up every morning, um, um, hey, Siri, what's the weather? Um, oh, by the way, I, I just have to say one other thing. Uh, when everybody worries about what AI is going to do to employment, and oh my god, we're not going to need any, you know, um, if you think back even 20 years ago, the number one sort of medium or unskilled uh, labor uh, piece was operators, telephone operators, right? I mean, you know, 411, et cetera. Um, there's only one operator in the world now, and her name is Siri. And the, but the fact is that those folks got retrained into the Verizons and at and and that's what will happen. So, so your current HomePod or, or Google Home is what's the weather, uh, you know, play the daily podcast, whatever it is. Literally, what, what we are spending a lot of time working on is how that can, through wearables or your watch uh, and your HomePod, do something like this. You had five asthma attacks last week, David. What's going on? Not feeling well. We got a, I got a cold starting. Had to go to Barstow twice for work. 
Barstow's nice and dry. What's your asthma keeping you from doing? Uh huh. Yeah, well, normal life for starters. Like walk upstairs, play with the kids, go see a movie. Okay, well, here's some weather for you. And I can't say it's nice out. Your neighborhood AQI is 160, humidity's down, and particulate matter's up, so you'll have a 65% increased risk of an attack today. You got some popcorn in the house? Ah, sure. I get it. Not going out today. Right. And keep your Advair inhaler nearby. Okay. Every two hours, I take one shot, right? That's it. You want me to remind you when you need to take it? Send me an SMS. Okay. Talk with you soon. So that, that's where we're heading. And uh, my newest book is called Bless This Mess, A Picture Story of Healthcare. And the concept is that literally in 2018, we were a mess. And then 2028, we got admitted to the Intergalactic Council of Awesome Healthcare Systems. Now, one of the things that's interesting about this is I was just in London because I'm on this thing called the Center for Progressive Policy, looking at what's right and what's not right about the NHS. And they're talking about healthcare reform there. In Canada, you're talking about healthcare reform. The fact is, healthcare reform has managed to confuse everybody. It says, actually, I'm not a doctor, I'm the healthcare minister. That's okay, I'm not the patient, I'm his attorney. We've all lost <laughs> where we are. And, and I was thinking back to this because one of my mentors was a guy named Bill Kissick. And 35 years ago, Dr. Kissick from Wharton wrote a book that could have been written today. Medicine's Dilemmas, Infinite Needs, Finite Resources. Sound familiar? And he was the first one to talk about the iron triangle of cost, access, and quality. He said, if you remember your geometry, if you increase one angle, you've got to decrease another. So if you increase access, you either have to increase cost or, or decrease quality, et cetera, et cetera. He said, unless you're willing, back 35 years ago, to disrupt the system, and disruption is painful. And what's fascinating is, when I was looking at the NHS, they wanted to provide access to everybody, but they weren't really willing to disrupt the system. If you look at our country, we had President Obama saying, uh, good news, we're going to increase access, increase quality, and decrease costs, and it's not going to be painful. That's impossible geometrically. We have President Trump, I think he said it's going to be terrific, unbelievable, and huge, but I think he meant the same thing. But the simple fact is that this is the reality. So, so as one of my colleagues said, we're delivering Star Wars technology in a Fred Flintstone delivery system. And what really hit me about this was this that I had a chance to work with Apple in the just pre-iPhone era. And, and Apple stock was $15 a share back then. That was 27 splits ago, because they did a 7 to 1, they did a 5 to 1. So I think we calculated it the other day that it was about, it's about 2,900 today from that 15. They were going to get bought out by Sun Microsystems. And um, for $13 a share, the, the the shareholders wanted 17. But everybody said Steve Jobs had just come back. He'd come back with his Blueberry IMAX. Let's see what he comes about up with. And you can watch it on YouTube. It's the first time he came out with the black turtleneck. And everybody was thinking incrementally, just like we think incrementally in healthcare. What were the coolest things back in the early 2000s? Laptops, operating systems. Boy, I wonder what he's going to come up with, a, a cool laptop, a cool operating system? So he came out. Here's our new laptop, the PowerBook 5300, worst laptop ever. Here's our new, here's our new operating system, Mac OS 6, and walked off. Stock went down as he was walking off. Then he came back. Oh, one more thing, and it was a thing holding 200 MP3s. And you say, well, you know, that's pretty cool, except that literally the Wall Street Journal article that day, because the stock went down about 20%, was Steve's either crazy or on drugs. Well, he was on drugs, he was not crazy. Uh, but the fact is, because it wasn't clear that MP3s were going to make it. In fact, there was a competing technology called Sony Minidisc, and most of the other MP3 players had gone bankrupt. I said, you're going to build this company around MP3 player? Here's what he recognized. They were going through a once-in-a-lifetime change from a computer company to a digital lifestyle, and he was putting his flag on the digital lifestyle. Who knows if he had in his mind everything else that was part of that. Now, if you take one thing out of what we talk about today, it's that we're going through a similar once in a multi-generational change um, from a business-to-business -business model to a business-to-consumer model. And when you ask, these are some of my students, and uh, our model has become healthcare with no address, what does that mean to them? Healthcare in 2028 will be real-time, patient-driven, simple, augmented, unscaled, without any address, consumer-centric, Frictionless. Convenient. Design enabled. And human. So uh, how much of that exists today? 
So what I had to look at is an 18 hospital system that was built around coming to my hospital, almost like Apple when it was making computers, at a time when we're going from a business to business to a business to consumer model, from a time when it was house money to what will be individuals' money, from the time when it was just dealing with employers and insurance companies to individuals making decisions. And for any of you who are in your 20s here or have uh, children in, in your 20s, just listen to them. I have a daughter who's 29. She worked at, right at a university hospital. She called me up one day and she said, Dad, what do you think about this? Uh, and it was a small hospital outside of where she worked. I said, well, why, Lynn? You're right on the university hospital campus. Well, don't worry. I need, um, and she has the kind of insurance, at least in our country, that I think most people will have. It's a few hundred dollars a month, but it's a $3,000 deductible, and she made about $60,000 a year. And she said, um, Dad, um, it's $200 of my money if I get it done at that hospital, and $800 of my money if I get it done at the university hospital that you ran. That's $600. That's a weekend in Miami, dude. I said, yeah, well, I know that, and I'm dad, uh, not dude, but, um, um, Oh, and one more thing. I went on healthgrades.com, and they have the same grade. And I went on um, leapfrog.com, they have the same amount of errors. Oh, Dad, one more thing. I went on patientslikeme.com. Do you know the waiting room is cleaner and the staff is friendlier uh, at that hospital than the university hospital you ran? So that kind of transparency is what folks are, are, are depending on. And no matter where you are at, being non-consumer centric is the biggest threat to any, any industry. And what I would argue with you is that literally every single one of these, every single one of these, and I had an opportunity to meet uh, Reed Hastings, and you know, he, he make, makes it very clear that Blockbuster had all the DVD sending technology and streaming technology before Netflix, but they said, God, we make all this money from late fees. You know, we'll, we'll get to that when we can. Uh, and you can see what happened. Every one of these folks had, had an opportunity uh, to become consumer-centric. So I would argue that we're really not. This says we're running a little behind, so I'd like each of you to ask yourself, am I really that sick, or would I just be wasting the doctor's valuable time? <laughs> right? We've all been in that situation. I had a chance to consult with an OBGYN practice, and it was almost amazing. They, they were losing some patients, and they were going through patient complaints, and I listened to them, and they were, they were reading a letter from a patient, a complaint, that while she was waiting in the, in the um, room, the exam room with a paper gown. She was waiting for 25 minutes for the doctor, and she listened to him making a uh, tea time uh, for a golf thing uh, that weekend. Now, what do, you think, what do you think they decided to do? It was the four doctors in that practice and the office manager. They made it say, gosh, we better move the phone further away from the patients. Now, in any other industry, that, that, that business would be out of business except for healthcare. So what we did at Jefferson is we looked at things a little differently. We said, look, the past for an academic medical center has been literally academic and clinical. And research funding is not going up, clinical revenue is not going up, and we can't keep putting on the backs of, of students. So we moved to a four-pillar model of academic, clinical, philanthropy, and innovation. And our largest alternative sources of revenue now are now based on, um, on innovation. My office is in a 180-year-old um, uh, Federal Reserve Building, the first Federal Reserve for the United States of America, and we had the largest vault. And this is actually now, we turned that 180-year-old vault into where we do all of our Jeff design, 3D printing, artificial intelligence, and virtual reality. So, so our, our entire uh, new vision became, instead of just we're going to be number one in NIH funding, was how can we reimagine healthcare education discovery to create unparalleled value? So our first success was back in 2013, we invested almost $25 million in a, in a telehealth uh, program called Jeff Connect. That we literally said our goal was to have Jefferson always be within reach. We are now at the point where 75% of our non-ambulance, non-trauma ER visits can be literally handled through virtual triage and Jeff Connect, either through urgent care, direct telehealth, or next day office scheduling. So literally, from folks that would have to stay, wait five hours in, a, in an ER that does level one trauma, they can now literally, through one of these three things, in a much more cost-effective and better outcome way, get their care. And one of my mentors, a guy named John Scully, who's the former CEO of Apple, and he always says, he says, stop talking about the technology when you talk about health. You guys say, isn't it cool we're doing telehealth? Or isn't it cool we're doing virtual reality? He said, we don't talk about telebanking. 
We don't get up in the morning and say, I'm going to tell a bank this morning. It's just the banking went from 90% of your banking be done in a bank, preferably before four on Mondays to Thursdays, to 90% being done at home, where we're frustrated if you can't deposit a check at 5 o'clock in the morning with your iPhone or Android. And that happened through a variety of, of technologies. So what's going to happen in healthcare, as you'll see in a minute by our predict predictions, is that at least 50% of healthcare will happen at home. And if you're not prepared for that, then you're going to be a dinosaur. So at Jefferson, we decided to become literally a, as we like to say, a 195-year-old academic medical center thinking like a startup company and saying, how can we turn our 18 hospital system and our, our two campus university into healthcare with no address? And what are the implications to that for the humans? What are the implications for that financially? So we, first thing we did is we said, what are all the things that you can do in the rest of your consumer life that you can't do in healthcare? So one of the ones that, um, that we, we invested in was virtual rounds. Now, if you think about it, we have a National Cancer Institute Cancer Center, one of 60 in the country and the United States. And um, if you have a mom or dad in a Philadelphia or a New York cancer center, and you live in Toronto, and your sister lives in Miami, you're still calling your mom. Say, mom, what did the doctor say? I don't know. He or she came in at 6 AM with six young people that look like they just got out of high school. I think they call them residents or something. But I'm really confused. All right, well, put me over to the nurse's station. Oh, I'm sorry. The doctor's in the OR uh, all day. He or she will call you uh, at the end of the day. That's in 2018. So we said, well, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So we partnered with a company called Blue Jean Software. And what happens at, at Jefferson now is that we basically say, is there anybody you'd like to communicate with while you're in our cancer center? Yes, I have a son in Toronto and a daughter in Miami. Great. Um, um, we're going to send them HIPAA-compliant software. And we text them when we're making rounds, and they're part of rounds. Now, I had a chance to be an undercover boss, not not by planning, but um, the day before Father's Day, I had emergency lung surgery at Jefferson. Um, and I had three children that were, that were scheduled to, to come and meet me. One was coming down from Alaska, one was coming up from Tampa, one was coming uh, down from New York. Um, and all they knew was that dad had emergency lung surgery. They knew nothing else about what was going on. But I had signed up for virtual rounds. So literally, this is, and this is not simulated, this is real. This is five minutes out of anesthesia, five minutes out in the recovery room with my surgeon, Dr. Nate Evans, um, uh, and with three computers and iPads with my three children, with Dr. Evans telling them that I'm going to be OK, five minutes out of, out of the OR, five minutes out of anesthesia. Now, all three of them said that I offered them cars, which is why we don't do it five minutes after anesthesia anymore. But, um, but the simple fact is that, um, <laughs> that, that when you think about what that meant to them, or what that means to any patient, knowing that, that literally um, I can actually uh, communicate with the doctor wherever I am. And by the way, we do the same thing in discharge, so that the family doc or, or the nurse practitioner that's going to be following up knows exactly what we told uh, the patient uh, or the caregiver uh, right afterwards. And, and so you know, what was interesting about this is this ended up in, uh, in, in uh, Forbes as a really cool technology. And I think this is going to be a theme of a lot of things today. On the one hand, I said, yeah, aren't we cool? On the other hand, I said, wait a second. We could have done this three years ago with FaceTime, or five years ago with Skype, or 15 years ago with the phone. But we didn't, because patients didn't demand it. And we didn't care enough about really doing those kind of things to actually think that that was really important. We knew that it wasn't great, that the family members didn't know what was going on. But we said, well, gosh, you're lucky to be in my hospital and to see me as a doctor. Um, we have 37 hospitals that use us for neurosurgery. We're the second largest neurosurgery entity in the country. So people come from all over. 35% of our post-op visits now are basically done sending the patient home with a robot and literally uh, having the post-op visit at home. This is a uh, sort of a miniaturized version of one of those. Good morning, Mr. Lehman. Good morning, Dr. Rosenwasser. How are you feeling this morning? Good. feel very well. Actually, uh, battling a cold and getting over that. OK. Any headaches? No. Are you? Can you turn your head so I can actually see the incision? All 
right. Well, we'll we'll be in contact with the return appointment, and we'll and Maureen will be in contact with getting the RP Express back to us. The RP Express is All the right. robot. Thanks very you. much. All right. You too. All right. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. I, I see your kids looking in there. There he is, right yeah. behind you. Okay. Yeah. How you yeah. doing? Dr. Right. Jackson. Yeah, it's my son Jackson. My you, oh, yeah. hi. How are you? You you kids should be off to school pretty soon, huh? Yeah, yeah they're going to be going to school very soon. All right. All right. All right. Take care. Signing off. All right. Take care. All right. She didn't want to miss out. So so the um, so you think about that. That's the chair of neur neurosurgery at Thomas Jefferson University Hospital. An individual that a year ago would have literally drove, driven for three hours, paid fifty dollars to park waited an hour in the, uh, in the waiting room, and then left. And, and it gives Dr. Rosenwasser a chance to do a lot of his post-op visits between 6.30 and, and 7.30 before he starts uh, office hours. Patient satisfaction and family satisfaction has gone up uh, for our neurosurgery team uh, by about 35%. And by the way, there's some technology happening that's making that stuff even cooler. This is a company out of Santa Barbara called Ventana that is looking at turning uh, telehealth from two dimensions into three dimensions using holographic images. But there's a lot of hope going forward. I don't want you to be discouraged. Thank you so much. That's so great to hear. Um, and again, it's so nice to be able to talk with you even though we're on different sides of the world. But this was, this was really reassuring. Oh, it's my pleasure and I'll see you soon stateside. Brings telehealth to a whole different dimension. So, so by the way, uh, as part of my research, we started to talk to patients about what they expect. And this is patients under 45. And uh, three quarters expected doctors to have online scheduling with comparative rates by 2018. This is in the United States of America. Two thirds expected they'll have social networking opportunities to discuss health related topics and compare providers. Nine out of 10 expect to have two way electronic communication directly with their providers. Four out of five expect to be able to access all their patient information to do their bank accounts online. And interestingly, uh, more and more folks expect to have total access to family members and patient charts, both reading and writing, as well as the ability to participate in rounds in person or virtually. So in our children's hospital, for example, uh, patients' families can write on the charts, because when you think about it, uh, we have nurses' notes, we have physician notes, but if the mom is staying with that, with that child, he, she knows probably what's going on better than anybody. And she says, you know, he, he had a, a tough night or whatever, that's, that's important. So for us as providers, we've looked at things incredibly differently. We stopped all of our billboard advertising. We stopped most of our TV advertising because it's ridiculous, right? I mean, I don't know what it's like in this country, but in my country, it's, you know, somebody has cancer, they walk into a cancer center, they walk out and they're frolicking in the weeds and everything's great. That's just not how it works. And what we recognized is that nobody really makes their decision of where to go if they, God forbid, have pancreatic cancer by going up and down the highway and looking at who has the coolest billboard. So we took all those dollars and looked at how can we guide consumers to give them the information they need to make good decisions about their health. Because we recognize that the more consumers are engaged in managing their own health care, um, the more satisfied they are and the more that they're willing to help us keep things literally great outcomes, great access, uh, and a lower cost. So we actually looked at, we looked at becoming Target and Walmart. And why did I say that? Um, I give some talks for, uh, for Wharton on uh, what happened in retail and what lessons we have for that in health. And when you think about it, when Amazon really started to disrupt retail, there were folks that said, oh my god, we got to get rid of stores and be all E. Well, that wasn't the right thing because Amazon sort of had that cornered. And then there were places like Sears and Penny's that said, you know, hey, that's a fad. You know, we're just going to keep deep stores. So the, so the Target and Walmart model really fits well for an academic medical center because what they said is, wait, we have great stars and we have great models, but we also are going to have to compete in this online e-market. I look at it and say, I always want to be a great academic medical center that people can get the best and most acute care but then I also have to be healthcare with no ad address. So we've started to look at how we can inspire loyalty at a whole different level with patients by giving consumers a single point of contact and creating a seamless experience across the continuum. And by the way, there's going to be a whole lot more around what consumers are going to demand. Uh, some of it won't be good, by the way. 
Um, my colleague David Feinberg from uh, Geisinger Medical Center is actually going out to Google, uh, started uh, one of the first guarantees, where if you're not satisfied with your care, we'll give you your money back. There's more and more of those kind of things uh, happening. So, um, and these are two companies that I'm involved with that um, may scare you or may excite you, depending on, on how you view this stuff. Um, anybody ever use Metacritic for movies? So Metacritic is this thing where basically, you know, you can put a movie in and you have your preferences and it'll give you what every, every newspaper, every reviewer said about that movie. Uh, and it'll do a meta-analysis and it'll give you a score. And you can sort of, you can sort of put your, your own thing. I think the Toronto paper is more important than the Los Angeles paper, whatever, or this is the kind of movies I like. It'll give you a score. They're, this company is now doing the similar type thing uh, for physicians, nurses, hospitals. You know, based on publicly available data, uh, uh, whether, you know, whether it's errors, whether it's uh, what people say on Yelp, et cetera, um, literally that's, that will be a metacritic where you'll be able to look at different hospitals. The other one that, that is, uh, in some respects, more interesting is, um, so I'm an obstetrician, um, and um, you think about a 25-year-old woman who has uh, been told she's pregnant. Back in the old days, when I was in private practice, that 25-year-old woman would go to her 65-year-old, probably male primary care doc, saying, congratulations, Mrs. Smith, you're pregnant. I'm going to send you to my obstetrician, Dr. Clasco. There is a 0.0% chance that a 25-year-old woman today will say, oh, that's great. That's exactly who I want to go to. <laughs> what they'll say is, well, that might be who you'd go to if you got pregnant, but you know what? You're not going to get pregnant, and, I, and you can give me four or five names, but I'm going to check on everything I can to make sure that, that they satisfy mine. So we actually started a Match.com for obstetricians and providers. Now, I met my wife on Match.com. She's right over there. She, she was the associate publisher of Vogue. I was the dean of a medical school. She went to all Catholic uh, universities, University of St. Francis, Marquette Academy, wrote this incredibly detailed 100.0% accurate uh, uh, profile on herself. I wrote a, I guess by today's American standards, sort of accurate uh, uh, <laughs> profile. I think my picture was uh, my cat backwards shooting a basketball, not what I do every day. Somehow, somehow we, got, we got matched up. This is literally using AI algorithms to basically say, and, and the 30 second version is, um, patient will be able to put, hi, I'm a, um, I'm a newly obstetric patient uh, in Toronto. Um, I have, um, um, I, I have, uh, I'll send you my HIPAA compliant uh, medical history if you're interested. Um, I want uh, a predominantly female group that will um, accept my doula. Uh, I can only uh, get off on Fridays and you know, whatever, else, whatever other criteria they want. And the obstetricians or, or nurse providers will go and, and send their stuff. Oh, by the way, I'd like to see all your data. Uh, you know, whether it's your, your leaf frog scores or what patients say about you. By the way, you don't have to put your data in. Just like on Match.com, you don't have to put your picture. But there's usually an assumption if you didn't put your picture, there was a reason. And then similarly, there would be an assumption that if you didn't put your data, there would be a reason. What's interesting about that Match.com for obstetricians and patients is I go around our country, United States, and, and I'd say half of the docs I talk to say, all right, that does it. I am done practicing obstetrics. This is not what I went to medical school for. This is the last straw. The other half say, cool, I love it. Now, it's very gender and age related. And I'll leave it up to you as to what gender and what age uh, uh, said cool. So I think the reason this is important is because I got a chance to give a talk at Standard & Poor's. And this is what it sounded like uh, from the analyst about at least nonprofit healthcare. We're at a crossroads. One row leads to total destruction. The other row leads to utter despair. Let's hope we choose the right one. Because <laughs> they basically said that, look, as nonprofit healthcare providers, we're really not going to have, you're just, you're just going to have to disrupt the way that you do things. And every time we go to your boardrooms, we hear incremental. We, we hear this kind of thing. Instead of risking anything new, let's play it safe by continuing our slow decline into obsolescence. So, so for us, we decided to go full out. And we basically decided, look, we don't have the skill set in our university to think outside incrementally. So we actually merged our university with a top 10 fashion design, architecture, sustainable environment university. Um, and um, 
really created a joint, what doesn't seem like a normal match.com of a 195-year-old uh, academic medical center with a, a university that had specialized in design, engineering, and commerce, architecture, and, and the built environment. But what that allowed us to do is actually start a whole new model. Our fastest growing academic piece is the Institute of Emerging Health Professions. What jobs are going to be needed 10 years from now in a, in a very different environment? And by the way, because I know it's the theme of this conference, some of them are more human. Some of them are, if healthcare is going to be at home, we're going to need to create community ambassadors. We're going to need to think about genomics and genetic counseling different. And we even, we even started, at least for our country, the first uh, master's in medical cannabis education and research, which besides giving me a couple upticks with the students, um, literally allowed us to get a grant for about $3 million. So for us, our, our new university ventures have been a college of digital health, the first in the United States of America, College of Emerging Health Professions, a huge online learning piece, and a, and a communications future center. We started uh, the first combined MD Masters in Design. What's the design of the human experience from the time somebody decides to become part of the Jefferson community to, to, to them being sick? But how do, we, how do we design a wellness program? How do we look at social determinants of health? What about food as medicine? Um, so this design thinking curriculum, we partner with Princeton University. They get in uh, to, to our medical college after their first year undergraduate at Princeton. They, they take their whole four years at Princeton. They have to major in something cool that is not chemistry or biology. They take the minimum amount of science courses. They don't have to take the MedCats. And then when they're done and they graduate from Princeton, they get an MD Master's in Design. And literally for us, our, our revenue has increased uh, uh, triple, and it's been predominantly around the innovation pillar, digital innovation, and strategic ventures. Our latest one has been a partnership with Silicon Valley. And one of the things that I would really, really encourage you uh, in, in wherever you are is to look at how you can partner with what will be a trillion dollars spent on disrupting technology. In the past, we've been the resistors. If you look at why EMRs are so messed up now, it's because back 20 or 25 years ago when Judy Faulkner, the CEO of Epic, said, hey, I want to create EMRs, we all laughed. So it was done by, soft, by software engineers, and now we're saying, boy, these don't really fit well into a human environment. So we decided to really go all in with them. And one of the areas that's been our, our biggest one has been around smart clothing. So um, you know, again, we, we have a fashion design university. And uh, again, I do think that that, that will be uh, the biggest change. And, and this has become what we call a four-pillar partnership. And this is what I mean. We, um, at a time where most of our traditional revenue is decreasing, so we started the uh, Institute for Cannabis Medical Education and Research. We got a $3 million gift from a foundation out of Australia called the Lambert Foundation, which is looking at cannabinoids uh, uh, in different treatment modalities. Their for-profit arm is called Ecofiber. It happens to be one of the largest companies looking at hemp being carbonized as a model medium for wearables. So the concept being your pajamas, your T-shirt will monitor everything about you put it into a large AI database so when you're sleeping, if you have an AFib, we'll know about that uh, uh, whenever we know about it. And they said, by the way, the two people doing the best work in fashion design in your country um, are in this place called Philadelphia University. Do you know anything about that? I said, yeah, we actually own that university now. Out of that came a partnership where we, we own 10% of Ecofiber, which is going on the Australian Stock Exchange in March. The reason I bring that up is at a time where it's so much harder to really realize our mission around health inequities and research and academics, the ability to use our three million patient encounters in a positive way, in an innovation way, is incredibly important. By the way, this is another thing where we partnered with Apple. Um, while you might not want to see this show up in the middle of a date or in a conference, the simple fact is that if you have a one-click thing like this, there's a 75% increased chance that you'll actually make that appointment. In our country, it's amazing, but literally about 60% of things like colonoscopy appointments are still sent through the US mail. Now, you get that in the US mail, you open this up, you're probably not putting that on the top of, oh boy, I can't wait to, to get up early tomorrow morning and schedule that. Whereas if, if, if you get this, much better chance of doing that. 
So our, our latest partnership has been with a company called General Catalyst. General Catalyst is one of the largest VCs out in Silicon Valley. They were the uh, original investor uh, in Airbnb, Snapchat. Um, there's a guy named Hamont Taneja, T-A-N-E-J-A, -E who runs that. He just wrote a book called Unscaled, and I really suggest you read that book. It's around the whole concept of what's going to happen in health. And he talks about Airbnb. It used to be if you wanted to build a bigger, better hotel chain than the Marriott or Omni, you'd build bigger and better hotels. Now you build no hotels, and you just make it easier for people to get together with real estate that already exists. So what, what he and I got together on is what he calls an obsession toward making what's difficult in healthcare easier. By the way, that's a good, good obsession to have, a good part of what we're going to talk about. So, so for us, it's creating an environment where EHRs, treatment protocols, and all information is accessible wherever needed. It's creating a layer on top of any EMR. And it's creating a flex flexible digital ecosystem as a marriage between tech and healthcare delivery that will reduce costs, transform the patient experience. He already has over $300 million worth of funding, and we're the, the academic medical center working with him. So this is what will happen. And this is looking back from 2028. Uh, this is one of the uh, slides that I worked together uh, on our IBM Watson board. By 2020, 25% of hospitals with a billion dollars of net revenue were providing real-time genomic decision support at the time of of treatment ready. By the way, that's already happening. We partnered with one of Haymont's companies called Color Genomics, and we are now offering free genomic and subtype testing to all 30,000 of our employees. And by the way, that company is going at risk with us because there are five areas where those subtypes actually will change the care, and we're self-insured. So for example, there are certain subtypes, people who have depression, that are on serotonin agonists, we know that it doesn't work. So literally, those people are still depressed, they're taking a serotonin agonist, they're getting the side effects, and we're paying for all those drugs. So literally, there's a certain subtypes where we know the PSAs are ineffective. So people are either given false positive uh, uh, and, and having procedures they didn't need, or false negative hope. By 2022, 20% of the population with chronic conditions were relying on virtual health assistance for wellness and management. By 2025, 35% of all care in the US was delivered virtually. And by 2027, think telebanking. For the first time, the majority of interactions were virtual or remote, and the majority of those involved were AI or machine cognition applications. By the way, that is not radical to the folks out at Mars here or out, at, um, out in Silicon Valley or Boston in the United States. That's, and, and, and what they, they call us incumbents. So they say the incumbents don't get it. So you might look at this and say, yeah, that's, yeah, that, that's not going to happen. They think, if anything, this is conservative. So literally, if, we're, if you're not prepared for that, and by the way, there's some big issues. I just want to spend a minute talking about privacy and security, because uh, when you talk to patients in this world, that's one of the things that they worry about a lot. When we asked US consumers, which is more important to them, data security or convenience, um, they said, well, when it comes to things like diet and exercise, have at it. But I don't, want, I don't trust anybody other than my doctor with my um, uh, with my actual medical records and health data. And this is really what they're concerned about. Pizza Palace, guaranteed hot in 30 minutes or it's free. This is Mary. May I take your order? Hi, uh, Mary. Yes, I'd like to order. This is Mr. Kelly? Uh, yes. Thank you for calling again, sir. I share your national identification number as 610-204-9998-45-54610. Is that correct? Uh, yes. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. I see you live at 736 Montrose Court, but you're calling from your cell phone. Are you at home? I'm just leaving work, but I'm... Oh, we can deliver to Bob's Auto Supply. That's at 175 Lincoln Avenue, yes? No, I'm on my way home. How do you know all this stuff? We just got wired into the system, sir. Oh, well, I'd like to order a couple of your double meat special pizzas. Sure thing. There'll be a new $20 charge for those, sir. What do you mean? Sir, the system shows me that your medical records indicate that you have high blood pressure and extremely high cholesterol. Luckily, we have a new agreement with your national health care provider that allows us to sell you double meat pies as long as you agree to waive all future claims of liability. What? Do you agree, sir? You can sign the form when we deliver, but there is a charge for processing. The total is $67 even. $67? Well, that includes the delivery surcharge of $15 to cover the added risk to our driver of traveling through an orange zone. I live in an orange zone? Now you do. Looks like there was another robbery on Montrose yesterday. Hmm. You could say $48 if you ordered our special Sprout Submarine Combo and picked it up yourself. Comes with tofu sticks. Those are very tasty, sir. Good value, too. But I want double meat. Well, I'm sure you can afford the $67, then. You just bought those tickets to Hawaii. They weren't cheap, eh? 
Oh, but I see you checked out the budget beach bomb at the library last week. Hmm, up to you, sir. All right, all right. I'll get the sprout subs. Good choice, sir. Gotta watch that waist if you're hitting the beach, eh? 42 inches. Wow. Man, I'd say tofu and sprouts is, like, required. That's how much? Just between you and me, there's a $3 off coupon in this month's Total Men's Fitness magazine. Your wife Betty subscribes to that, right? Anyhow, clip that and it's $19.99 even. Whoa, looks like you maxed out on all your credit cards. Bring cash, okay? So, so literally, if, 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 you, if you just watch what's happening with Facebook and Google and, and, and other things, that is, again, not science fiction. And the, the one thing that we've looked at is really making cybersecurity an apex process. So for us, literally, we literally have our trustees involved. Our, it's become one of our standing committees. So we talk about finance, quality, and security as three of the things that are, that are incredibly important. Uh, the role of IT is also to recognize that doctors aren't very good at following instructions. So, um, so if there's ways that we can make it easy to use strong passwords, et cetera, and not have it be this kind of thing, which is what we found when we actually looked at a lot of our positions. We're spending a lot of time and resources on looking at how technology can make a difference in that, whether that's blockchain or chip cards or cybersecurity insurance or looking at biometric-based cybersecurity. We actually have a pilot uh, around things like touch ID and retinal scans, uh, uh, even for our, uh, for our telehealth program. So enough on technology, because this is about what, what is humans uh, need in technology, and we don't want the iPhone, as was mentioned by Gail, to be part of the, your primary care physician. So the second thing is we need an extreme makeover of medical education. Uh, Rowan Monar said uh, technology will replace 80% of what doctors do. And my friend Vino Kosala said, well, yeah, that's true, but any doctor that can be replaced by a computer should be. Um, so what does that mean? Well, in 2018, believe it or not, Doctors in our country, at least, are still chosen based on science GPA, MedCats, and organic chemistry performance. And somehow we're just amazed that doctors aren't more empathetic, communicative, and creative, right? Duh. Um, and then we put them uh, through uh, a residency uh, where empathy is not the first uh, thing that's, uh, that's necessarily taught. So if you, just, if you just take a step back and think about medical education, we have 12,000 applicants for our 290 slots. It's look to the left of you, look to the right of you, one of you will get in. Then you get in, and it's okay, well now, wow, I got in, I got through that filter. Oh no, look to the left of you, look to the right of you, one of you will get the best residency. You keep going through that, that meat grinder, and then we're amazed that we don't work as high power teams. When I went to Warden, the very first day they said, um, the most important decision you will make for your entire two years here is your study group, because every grade you get will be a study group grade. And they threw the hundred of us in a room and said, somebody from finance, somebody from accounting, somebody from management, somebody from marketing. It was, actually, it was really lousy for me because people said, what are you? I said, I'm a gynecologist. And nobody wanted me in their study group. I, it's true. I, I mean, I was literally left in the center of the room by myself. And um, you know, it was like gym class in the 60s as a little guy. But, but I got over it, and I learned to be very interdependent. Interestingly about that, my study group still gets together twice a year uh, since 1996. And my study group includes the CEO of Johnson Johnson, Alex Gorski, former COO of Honeywell. And actually, it was cool because Alex was my first commencement speaker when I took over at Jefferson. And, and instead of you know, talking about everything that Alex had done, I said, um, I told that story. I said, Alex brought me into a study group. I'd like to think that compassion as well as keen eye for talent is what got Alex the job as the CEO of the most trusted company in the world. And Alex got up there and said, well, um, Actually, President Class was partly right. There were two undesirables left in the center of the room. Um, but, and we did choose Dr. Class was clearly not compassion and definitely not uh, talent. Um, we were all young and poor at the time, and I said, let's take the gynecologist. At least he'll be able to pay for the pizza and beer. So sometimes it's better <laughs> not to know uh, why you did that. So, so I mentioned that, um, that uh, I, I got a large grant to look at what makes doctors different than other people. And this is what we found. The way we select and educate physicians, we've joined a cult around these four biases, a competitive bias, an autonomy bias, a hierarchy bias, and with an asterisk, a non-creativity bias. And this is what I mean by an asterisk. We are every bit as creative as any of you that aren't non-physicians. But when we asked entrepreneurs and business people, said, what got you to where you are? Creativity was number one, two, or three in 93% of the cases. When we asked physicians, what got you to where you are? It's strategy, focus, discipline. 
So, so they didn't think that creativity was going to get them out of things. And the reason I bring that up is if the world around you is changing and you think you're creative, you say, well, bring it on. I'm going to do really well in that world. If you think you're an autonomous, competitive, hierarchical creature and the world is changing, you're going to fight it. And that was really an aha moment for me because, because I would go to Wharton on the weekends and people would say, you're so lucky to be in healthcare. I was one of four doctors that was actually in that 100 class. And I said, you know, $2 trillion industry and in going through change, what a great time to be in. I said, yeah. Then on Monday morning, I'd be in the OR lounge. Healthcare stinks. I'm telling my son or daughter not to go into it. I wish things were like they were. Same, same input. We were viewing it very differently than other folks. And by the way, we're not doing such a hot job. Uh, again, this was the United States, but we asked people three years or less, how did we do teaching you as a medical school? Well, and this is around our country, 70% said you didn't do such a hot job. You taught me microbiology and biochemistry. Boy, I use that every day in my psychiatry practice. Um, and you taught me OBGYN and cardiovascular, but you didn't teach me how to manage change. You didn't teach me how to negotiate. You didn't teach me much about effective communications or making patients happy or running an effective meeting or healthcare disparities. Um, um, so really, I have $250,000 worth of debt and you taught me exactly half of what I need to know. And what makes it even more important is in the age of AI, literally, it's, who cares whether you can memorize that? That's gonna be on your iPhone or the robot next to you. It's knowing what, what questions to ask. And at last year's World Economic Forum, I think Jack Ma put it very well. No matter how artificial intelligence is good. Human being in the future competed with the machine on knowledge, you don't have a chance. Computer is always gonna be smarter than you are. When there's a car, forget about it, who runs faster. When there's a plane, don't think you can fly like a... When there's a computer, you know, computer is always smarter than you are. They never f forget, they remember everything, they never get angry, they calculate faster. But computer can never be as wise as a man. What's the difference between smart and wisdom? So if you think about it, uh, some of you might get sweats if you're physicians in this, but um, the, the, um, the gateway to getting into medicine is being able to memorize this, right? So I mean, you know, it's like, it's like if, if you get a C minus in organic chemistry, you are not becoming a doctor. It's like you know, running the 40 in the NFL combine in like 5-1, you're, you're out. Um, now think about how asinine that is, that my being able to have a final be, let's take all the carbons and oxygens out of this and see if I can fill them in, at a time when there's a 100% chance that that's on my iPhone, or within a couple years, there'll be a he, she, or it uh, uh, right next to me. It'll be met better at memorizing genomics than any, any human on the planet. So we started the first medical school in the country where we said we're going to choose students based on self-awareness, empathy, communication skills, and cultural competence. Interestingly, we partnered with two interesting companies. One was Southwest Airlines. Why? Because they used to pick pilots the way we pick doctors. They put two people on a simulator and say, you were 97th percentile, you were 94th percentile, you're our pilot. Then they realized that the pilots that landed in the Hudson or, or the Southwest Airlines pilot that did the emergency landing was not because she was 0.02% uh, better technically is because she could see the second and third order consequences of her decisions or communicate well. So now they put the two pilots on and they recognize after about 90% it's all the same. They have something happen in the cockpit. They look for your first reaction, your first reaction. The person with the clipboard is a behavioral therapist and looking at which of these pilots do we want in an emergency. The second group we used is a group called Telios that is the company that does all the interviewing for Google. My son graduated from Brandeis University with a degree in American Studies in the middle of the American Recession. And um, um, so American Studies was the degree that had the least chance of getting a job in the time of our history that had the least time of getting a job. So the chances of him not living in my basement were 0.0%. <laughs> he got a job at Google after seven interviews. He ended up not taking it to become an actor. That's cocktail party uh, discussion. But, um, um, but they didn't want to see his transcripts. They would call him on a Friday night and say, David, you know, where are you at? Well, I'm in Toronto, and I'm, I'm at this bar. Tell me about the people around you. They wanted to see how he could actually infer what he, what he could get from, 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 from humans. So we actually said, all right, we're going we're to take 56 students a year. We're going to erase all the objective criteria after they reach our minimums. And we're going to choose them based on self-awareness, empathy, communication skills, and cultural competence. This was one of the things that we did. We said, what do you see? We would bring the applicant, what do you see in this picture? Um, 
There was a woman in a white dress, kind of black turtleneck, and a snake. Yeah, but, but you know, what do you feel when you see this? I feel there's a woman in a white dress, a guy in a black turtleneck, and a snake. But, but what's it emoting to you? I mean, you know, you know tell, me, tell me what you're, what you're seeing. Well, it's emoting to me there's a guy in a black turtleneck, a woman in a white dress, and a snake. You'll have other applicants that right away will tell you the story of this. You know, I think that dress doesn't seem to fit right. I think that reflects the relationship, et cetera, et cetera. Then you might say, Steve, why does that matter? Well, I've delivered 2,000 babies in my career. It's incredibly easy delivering a normal seven and a half pound baby from a normal 25 year old. I mean, it's easy for me to say I'm on the other end, but it, it, it's, it's medically easy. It's incredibly difficult delivering an unscheduled Down syndrome baby. And 100% of the time, the first question will be, doctor, what does it mean? And I've watched good obstetricians that memorized organic chemistry formulas say, well, it's your 21st chromosome. Your, here's some of the medical complications your baby will have. I've watched great obstetricians get the what does it mean means what does it mean to my image of a perfect baby. And right away we'll say, this is a beautiful baby and I'll get you together with other people who have had beautiful babies like this before you leave the hospital. That 30 seconds is the entire difference between how that mom, in some cases that dad, imprints with that baby. Now here's why it's so important for this conference. Because there's a 100% chance that there's gonna be a Google Brain or an IBM Watson or a Verilon, he shear it next to me, that will take a picture of a baby I just delivered and be better than any human on the planet at being able to go through its database and say, this is exactly the chromosomal anomaly. There's a 0% chance that he shear it will get the what does it mean, means what does that mean to my image of a perfect baby which means that we have to train humans to be more human. In the past, we've trained humans to be sort of robots because we needed, we needed that. We didn't have robots. Now we're gonna have robots and we need folks to be, to be much more human. So, so um, I, I don't think the concern is artificial intelligence. I think the concern is that we, as physicians and nurses, have some real intelligence. So what we've done at Jefferson is we've taken a very different sort. We said, look, you know what? We're gonna do more and more of our first two years online, microbiology, biochemistry. Nobody comes to class anyhow, right? I mean, does anybody come to class to, to watch a professor do PowerPoints of the, you know? No, I mean, you know, it's, it's, they can get the MOOC, on, Stanford's MOOC, before they started medical school. So we do most of that online. And now we have humanities, introduction to creative writing, visualizing an anatomy, the art of the observation, the language of music are all part of our curriculum. Um, we, uh, well before I got here, about 50 years ago, we started the first scale of empathy. It's now used worldwide. But I think the important piece about it is that it, we recognized that empathy can actually be a learned skill. That it can be learned, it can be measured, and it can be used to test new initiatives in education. So we don't have to throw up our hands and say, you know, what can we do? One of the most successful things for us has been hotspotting. You guys know what that is? So, um, so the concept of, of, of looking at that 5% of patients who use 50% of healthcare resources and using medical students, nursing students, and humans to actually talk to those people. Boy, imagine that. So the best example I can give you of a, of a hot spot, they're student teams, where we had a patient that had been to the ER 16 times in six months. It cost Medicaid probably $500,000. She had some developmental disabilities, she had some chronic conditions, and she had an ostomy. So the hot spotters went out and talked to her. Well, it turns out a good part of her of it is she didn't really understand how to change her ostomy. And she knew if she came into the emergency room, somebody would do it for her. So they started texting her and they started helping her. She went a year without coming into the emergency room. She would just text her, her hot spotters. And it was a great, a great student said, you know, why don't you people understand that running the healthcare system recognize simple things that can cut costs and improve care instead of bringing in consultants that'll just bring in technology. We had, when I was in Allentown, we had 18% of the population was uh, Hispanic. They had the highest rate of premature labor of any place in the, in, in the state. And they didn't come in early for visits. So we tried all these things that didn't work. Well, we'll give you incentives to come in. A lot of it was cultural. The coming into the hospital is what you did when you were sick. So we actually partnered with uh, a place called Casa Guadalupe where we deputized folks to do the the easy parts of the exam, measuring the fundus and listening to the heartbeat. Now my obstetrician colleagues went nuts. How can we have a non-physician do, do that exam? It's taking a tape measure, going from the symphysis to where the bump ends, and then putting a Doppler and waiting for a heartbeat. So, so, and then what we would do is, the deal we made with those folks is every three months they would come in, if they were low risk, they had a very good looking Latino van driver, and they would come in and they would, they would basically, well we got a 100% response rate 
And we literally lowered that premature labor rate below that of the Caucasian population within two years. The reason I bring that up is those are not technology. Those are really just using humans to, to make a difference. So the third thing I, I want to just mention, and Nick, you brought it up, is, is about leadership. So this is a great quote from uh, Upton Sinclair. It's hard to get someone to do something when their salary depends upon them not doing it. We do that a lot in healthcare. And one of the things we looked at is, is, is we spent $10 million a year, best money I've ever spent, on changing the DNA of our physicians around this 180 degree turn. Physicians and nurses and, and pharmacists and, and, and other health professionals and like that. But one of the studies we did is we looked around medical staffs around the United States of America, and it was really interesting. In almost every place, about 20% of the docs get it. They'll follow everything you do. Yeah, you, well, I love what you're doing, Steve. 15% will never get it, no matter what you do. And then there's the 65% in the middle. What was interesting about our study is we saw the leaders, we spend 40% of our time with the folks that get it. We spend 45% of our time with folks that will never get it because they're loud and you know, we can cure anybody. We spend the least amount of time with the people that will change the culture in the middle. So what we did is we, we made the people that get it, our men, the mentors, we spend less time with them, but they gave, we gave them the skill set to mentor. We ignored the 15%. We call that administrative hospice. Just let them be comfortable and uh, <laughs> go, go to the next place. Um, and, um, and then we spend the most time on that 65%. And, and, and that's what we call JOLT, Jefferson Onboarding Leadership Transformation. 30 senior emerging leaders yearly, when I say senior, ranges in age from 30 to 70. Um, they have an application process, sponsor environment. They have three highly integrated streams, a classroom, project assignment, and executive coaching. And the outcomes have been really pretty incredible, but the one that, that has been the most has been around burnout. Because you've all seen this, but in your country, in our country, over half of physicians report at least one symptom of, of, of burnout. Um, and the issue is around all these things, but this is I really think the main issue. burnout is not necessarily just because of the job, but it's because people don't feel their worth. Uh, when people come to work and feel like they're a robot, that they're not being appreciated, respected, that they don't get the chance to improve matters, that's when burnout occurs. Uh, I don't think burnout is because of being overworked. I think a lot of people will work 16 hours a day in something they love, in which they feel their worth. So, so what we found is that, um, that capable physicians are more productive. Physicians that believe that they can make a difference are more productive. And this is really a, a problem with engagement, because if you don't have physicians who are capable, physicians who are learning the difference, they're not going to recommend the organization. The larger the size of an organization, traditionally, the less engaged its physicians are. So for us, we invested all that money in Joel. We're six years in. We just did a study where, remember I said 20, 65, and 15? We're probably now 40, 45, and 15 because we got those middle folks over to this side. And once you actually start to change once you actually start to change uh, that, you can see the kind of differences that it makes, 325% uh, improvement in dealing with difficult issues and situations. And by the way, that, that change also goes to how CEOs are incentivized. We were the health system for the Democratic National Convention. This is what um, uh, Secretary Clinton said. And she said, it's great to be in Philadelphia because of all the great things you've done in healthcare. The next day in the New York Times, it was found that the Philadelphia has the greatest discrepancy in life expectancy of any city in the United States of America. A baby born, a baby born literally today in, 20, in um, uh, Jefferson that goes to 19147 will live to 2104. A baby born 6.2 miles away will not make it to 2090. And we have six academic medical centers. So the fact is, it's not because we don't have hospitals or doctors, it's because we haven't recognized the importance of social determinants of health. And here's what we found. This is a study that we just finished. If we look at the hospital and board's mission, it's always about quality and safety, community engagement, diversity, patient and employee satisfaction. Um, if you look at the senior management incentives, it's often around EBITDA, hospital census, US News and World Report ranking, or the docs happy with our CEO. So what I said in my article is, if you want to look at what that hospital is going to look like 10 years from now, ignore what the board says, ignore what's on the website, look at how the CEO is getting incentivized. And the challenge I made to the folks in Philadelphia is, every one of us should have 25% of our personal incentive being de decreasing inequities in Philadelphia. And I'm proud to say at Jefferson, for the first year, 25% of my incentive is literally 
five different parameters in Philadelphia, most of which I have no control over, but it's forcing me to go and talk to the social agencies at, at a level that we never did before. And some of this is also remembering why you went into healthcare and, wh and why, you, why you applied to medical nursing school. Just tell you one quick anecdote, anecdote of, we, we always ask people to say, when did you think you were gonna actually lose your ability to, uh, 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 to become a doctor or nurse? So it was my first patient. I was a second year medical student. I went in with a white coat and I've memorized the history and the physical. And I went in and I did the history. I said, yeah, I got through that. I went to listen to the heart. And the patient goes, excuse me, uh, Dr. Clasco, um, um, shouldn't that stethoscope be in your ear? It was around my neck. Uh, and I said, oh my god, I have, I have to decide. I either have to uh, like just run out and go back to being a DJ or, 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 uh, or come up with a story. So I'm, I'm not proud of this, but I said, well, that's a new technique we have here at Hahnemann where we can feel the vibrations against our neck. I said, that's why I come to the university hospital, because you have all those new techniques. I'm even less proud to say, I said, yeah, boy, I won that round. Next day, the, 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 actually, the dean of students who, who was a patient's doctor was coming out back then with the three fellows and seven students. I want you all to listen to Mrs. Bazell's grade three systolic murmur. Dr. Bennett, how come you're not using that new technique that that good <laughs> young Dr. Clasco? So while I'm sitting in his office thinking about my career selling uh, pencils on Broad Street, I said I will never, ever lie to a patient again, and that became important. So the, the, the final action is this. We have to start learning from our mistakes. And, and, um, and, 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 and here's, here's another area where technology can really make a difference. So I'm a pilot, and every two years I have to get my technical competence assessed. I'm also a surgeon. Anybody want to guess the last time anybody objectively assessed my technical competence? About 35 years ago. And by the way, there is no surgeon in Toronto or London or Philadelphia that has had their technical competence assessed, other than by themselves, objectively in the last 30 years if they're 64 like I am. So the simple fact is, now that made sense because we didn't, just like everything else, we didn't have the technology, but now we do. We have simulators, and we, we built one of the largest assessment of technical team or competence centers, partnering with Lockheed Martin and, and the airline industry that can actually start to transplant medical advances and knowledge into improved patient care. So the fact is that we are still helpless when it comes to physicians with frequent complications. And you know what we found is, in our country, that at, at most, they end up getting proctored. If I have two complications in a month, and they're one in 500 complications, I might get proctored. And I'm either getting proctored by one of my best friends who says, look, Steve, I'm going to go over to the corner and do the Sudoku because I'm not going to judge you. Or by one of my competitors where I go before we scrub, hey, thanks so much for doing this and volunteering your time and proctoring me. Uh, if you say anything remotely negative about me, I'm going to sue you. Oh, I'm going to sue you personally so the hospital can't cover you. But again, thanks for volunteering for the medical executive committee. We have no way of determining someone who is not trained in new technology is competent. And in fact, the medical device companies go out of their way to make sure that you don't do that. The simulation center that we started had eight robots. Eight robots that Intuitive had given us to, to do robotic training. They would like you to spend a day, get a certificate, and then go out and, and, and go do, do robotics. We said, we're not going to give them a certificate until they can prove that they can do all the things that they would need to do to treat complications around robotics. They took the eight robots away. So at the end of the day, literally, we need to make sure that we have ways of doing that. And the whole see one, do one, teach one philosophy of medical education doesn't work if you're the one at the end of the table. I learned, um, I learned to intubate a one and a half pound baby in the middle of a chaotic uh, delivery room with the dad over me. Now, for those of you who know neonatology, the difference between the trachea and the esophagus is like this. The chances of you getting it right the first time, no, 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 that's not. Well, this is a one and a half pound baby. We now have simulators of different weights that do just about everything. They cry, they scream, they pee, they, they, they do everything. And you can literally make sure that you're doing. We don't let anybody now intubate a baby until they've proven they can do it on the simulator. And pretty soon, this is what you're going to see. And again, like a lot of things in healthcare, do we wait till it gets regulated? Or, or do we do it ourselves? And I've been a major uh, advocate of, of doing it ourselves. We, we partnered with United Airlines with our uh, simulation center, and they sent me a letter that an eight-year-old wrote, because even she got like what it was all about. She didn't know the name of her pilot, but she got what it was all about. She said, dear Captain, my name is Nicole. I'm eight years old. And it was my first flight, but I'm not scared. I like to watch the clouds go by. My mom says the crew is nice. I think your plane is good. Thanks for a nice flight. Don't mm up the landing. Love, Nicola. So while her mom might not have been thrilled that the only thing she uh, spelled right was that, the fact is even she got 
that it was about. And then this is the last thing. Um, we just signed a, a memorandum, memorandum of understanding with Kotaku University in Italy to create the first university that's approved by both the LCME in the United States and the accrediting bodies in Italy, where the, patient, where the doctor will be able to practice in either the United States or the European Union. The reason I bring this up is healthcare is the only thing that isn't global, right? If you're the head of Shanghai Bank and you're a great leader in finance and you come in the United States, you can be the head of any bank. If you're the chair of cardiovascular surgery in Bangalore, India, and you come into the United States, we make you retake your residency uh, and start all over because we have to teach you the amazing ways that we do things, uh, which are, by the way, just surgery and drugs. Um, it hit me because I was in India for two weeks. I hurt my back. I wanted a flexor Motrin. I went to the university hospital. They wanted to do acupuncture and Ayurvedic medicine. And I said, well, I'd like a flexor Motrin. They said, well, you have to go over to that alley over there where I think there's an American doctor that will use drugs. I got the acupuncture and Ayurvedic medicine. felt a whole lot better. So the, the concept of literally looking at how we can do training across countries, how we can develop common therapy protocols across countries, how we can adopt complementary medicine across different cultures. We just started something called a global kidney exchange, which can actually now expand who can get kidneys and kidney transplants. Uh, we have the first one happening between Catalca and Jefferson, uh, where an Italian patient will donate a kidney to somebody here and vice versa. And this is what the uh, seven-year program looks like that will give people a chance to literally be uh, approved by both the LCME and the Italian uh, licensing group. they will get a triple degree of a BS, an MD from TGAU, and an MD from Catholic University. So I'd like to leave you with a few quotes from um, actually the NBA. It's sort of important because Toronto uh, Raptors and the Philadelphia 76ers are battling it out. Um, so. Um, so the first is from Pat Riley. He said, when a uh, great team loses through complacency, it will constantly search for new and more intricate explanations to explain away defeat. After a while, it becomes more innovative in thinking up why they lost than thinking up how to win. I would argue we do a lot of that in healthcare and academics. Oh, healthcare is too complicated. We can't be consumer-centric like Amazon. Oh, you don't understand. Well, actually, yes, it is complicated. But the simple fact is, all those things that, that, that I just talked about can happen, whether it's around starting to look at food as medicine, around health inequities, how can we start to really look at social determinants of health using the technology we have, making doctors and nurses more empathetic, recognize they're going to be, those all things could happen. It would mean that hospitals, universities, licensing requirements, and payers and the government would all have to look at things differently. The second one, I think, is maybe even more germane to what we do. Jason Kidd um, had left um, um, and gone over to the Dallas Mavericks, who that year had been something like 24 and 52. And he got all excited. He said, I'm going to turn this team around 360 degrees. <laughs> we do a lot of turning things around 360 degrees in healthcare, where we say we're doing things and we end up in the same place. Um, and then finally, I'll leave you with. Uh, something from one of my mentors, this little guy named Yoda, about the importance of creativity. Because without getting docs to be more creative, they are doomed. You must make sure that the conference happens. Steve Clasco, an OBGYN doc from Philadelphia, will talk about creativity as a skill set, he will. That program will produce doctors who go home and defeat the dark side of non-creative healthcare. That group became the core group for an optimistic future. Yes. Learn what you can from the OBGYN doctor. And may the forceps be with you. Hmm? May the forceps be with you, and please let's start now. Thank you very much. <laughs>